Hello and welcome. I'm Lee Billings. I'm a senior editor covering space and physics here at Scientific American from my home office. Uh, thank you for being here with us today uh, to learn more about the future of Mars exploration with an emphasis on NASA's next rover to land there, Perseverance, which is going to land, I think, in February 2021. Uh, joining us today, we've got Casey Dreyer. I'm very glad to have him here. Uh, he's a senior space policy advisor at the Planetary Society and host of the monthly policy podcast, Planetary Radio Space Policy Edition. And where we are now, I think the, the forefront of Mars exploration is NASA's Perseverance rover, which is going to, again, land in a place called Jezero Crater in February 2021. You can see here on this slide some of the things that have come before. And all this stuff has really, again, built up to this moment. Uh, some of the things you're going to notice are, are, are orbiters that are still there today that are going to be providing support for Perseverance and other missions on the surface. You have some, uh, some rovers that are still operational, like Curiosity. You have the InSight. Lander, that's not a rover, uh, that's looking at Mars quakes and things like that. Uh, and, and of course, there's some things here that, that are no longer with us. This is stuff that's, I guess, just active now. So uh, for instance, Opportunity and Spirit are no longer there. Um, they, they, don't, they aren't on this, this timeline, even though there's a lot of other missions that came before. Uh, let's, uh, unless anyone has a question about this in particular, you can notice at the end there, there's this Mars sample return lander and Mars sample return China, maybe. Um, we're going to get into that kind of stuff towards the end about Mars sample return. Let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. Where we can get more into the, yes, planning for perseverance. This is where we're going to see things like the launch of this thing. Uh, and, and I think we should really, while we're looking at this though, Casey, let's start talking about Let's start talking about what Perseverance is and what it's really going to be doing on Mars. Yeah, Perseverance is kind of this transition mission. Uh, as you kind of saw from that last slide, NASA in particular, but a lot of nations have spent a lot of effort over the last 25 years to send a number of missions to Mars to really try to understand it as a system and do all of their science there at the planet, right? The, the term in situ, in place is the type of science that's been happening over the last um, 25 years in, in, in high priority, particularly at NASA. Perseverance is going to continue that uh, legacy with a huge suite of scientific instruments and other kind of exciting technological demonstrations at Mars. But it's also going to take the first step into this new era of Mars exploration, where instead of doing all the science at Mars, we want to start doing some of the science back here on Earth. And you do that by taking a piece of Mars, bringing it back to Earth, and then kind of unleashing the scientific capability of humans here and all the high performance scientific instrumentation we have at Earth on those Mars samples. Perseverance is that transition mission. It's going to do science at the surface, but it's also going to grab samples and prepare them to be brought back to Earth. So it's a, it's a very big mission, not just for the science it will do, but for the meta, you know, kind of for the symbol that it has of this step into this new era of Mars science. Right, right, okay. Uh, can we go ahead and get the next slide, please? And I, there is a question I'm gonna go ahead and uh, address. Uh, Bavia asks, a quick question, is the focus on the session on robotic exploration only, or will you also address human exploration? That's a great question. It's something I forgot to mention, Bavia. Um, we are going to address human exploration towards the end. Um, so, but it's mostly on robotic at the beginning and the middle. Um, all right, so now we're seeing here, you'll notice this is, these are some shots and maybe a little bit of footage of this thing getting put together for the rocket. Um, could you tell us, Casey, a little bit more about uh, how, what, what kind of machine Perseverance is? Like, you know, where, where it comes from in terms of the, leg, uh, the, the heritage it has um, in the hardware. Can we talk, because I want to get into some of the cool hardware that it's bringing to Mars and what's, what's unique and new. Yeah, Perseverance is a descendant in a way of, of the Curiosity rover that landed in 2011, which at the time was the largest, most capable rover ever sent to the surface. It's about the same size. It's a, you know, to within narrow margins. It's about the same weight. It's a little heavier. And it's, again, full of scientific instruments. The entire instrument suite is different. Um, and of course, it has the capability to drill and store samples uh, to leave for future missions to return to Earth. And so NASA really leveraged a lot of the engineering work and even some leftover hardware from the Curiosity rover in an effort to try to control the cost, basically, of the Perseverance rover. And that's why you see it look very similar, just kind of from this first order viewpoint. Okay, okay. Um, but but you, you, we haven't gotten into some of the, I, I do wanna kind of talk about some of the cooler stuff. We can actually go ahead and advance to the next video, I believe. Um, uh, so we, we've talked about how it's going to be sample return. That's huge. Um, but but it, it's, it has a, a, a couple of things other than the sample 
collection and caching stuff on it that that sure. are that are quite new, right? Uh, uh, like so, I think we're going to see some footage maybe now of a, an animation of is it a Mars copter we're going to see? Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about, about this. And I know, I know this is a little separate from Perseverance, right? Like Perseverance is just kind of the ship that this thing is sailing on, but they they do they are going to have some synergy here, right? Let's talk about that real smitten smidge real quick. Yeah, so there's a few what they would call technology demonstrations that are included in the Perseverance uh, rover package. So this includes the Ingenuity rover. This would be the first powered flight on another planet uh, using, as you can see, these very large, very lightweight uh, 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 wings and propeller system. And it's a, you know, it's it, the Mars helicopter itself was kind of a bonus add-on that Congress provided the funds for over the last few years. And it's going to ride along with Perseverance and then do this 30-day demonstration mission right at the beginning, uh, right not long after it lands in February of 2020, uh, 2021. Um, beyond that, there's not a, a amount of science demonstration or, or happening with the Ingenuity rover. It's really a technological demonstration. Um, and then another similar technological demonstration that feeds directly into future human spaceflight needs is a system called MOXIE, which is going to attempt to generate oxygen, O2, from the Martian uh, atmosphere itself. So it's going to be one of the first demonstrations of um, in situ resource utilization, ISRU, which is one of these really important technologies in order to build and sustain a future human settlement on the surface of Mars, because you just can't take everything with you, right? You're gonna have to live off the land to some degree. So Perseverance contains these two technology demonstrations in addition to this broad scientific suite. And I should say just in addition, the scientific goals of Perseverance beyond sample return is to provide or to, to really look for signs of ancient life on Mars. So this is a direct astrobiological you know, search mission, kind of in the heritage of Viking. And this is the first time since Viking that NASA has a directed goal to find biosignatures uh, on Mars. So this is also a big step in that. And it contains a number of advanced instrumentation to kind of look at the rock and mineral records that it's going to uh, be exploring in this Jezero crater, which used to host an ancient lake on the surface of Mars, probably around 4 billion years ago. And more importantly, it has this big river delta flowing into the lake. Deltas on Earth are known for concentrating organics and concentrating uh, biosignatures, as we would call them on Mars. And it's going to be driving up to this ancient delta structure and looking through the layers of the rock for these types of preserved biosignatures uh, on Mars. So this is just for that alone is an incredibly exciting mission within the idea being that it, anything interesting it finds, it can bottle up and prepare to bring back it for a future uh, sample return mission. Yeah, and, and you know we're going to get more into Jezero in just a minute and some of the search for life stuff, but I, I did want to focus a little bit on on these other pieces of, of hardware that exist um, on Perseverance. So again, you have Ingenuity you mentioned, you have um, Moxie, the experiment to to use in situ resources um, and to to make oxygen. Um, I, I'm thinking about how okay, so maybe Moxie is its own thing, and that's more for the future in the same way that the sample returns for the future. It's preparing for the future. Ingenuity is a technology de demonstration you mentioned uh, the first powered flight another planet of course uh, I bet most of our viewers know that that's kind of maybe somewhat related slightly to uh, dragonfly that might go to Titan uh, or that it will go to Titan um, which is another uh, powered flight mission to Saturn's moon uh, Titan um, but but the real question I think is uh, you know well it's kind of twofold I'm just rambling one is you know is ingenuity going to be helping uh, perseverance maybe suss out some of these potentially interesting rock formations and things uh, from overhead, is it going to be helping guide it right there? Uh, anything like that? And 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 then the other question is, we should probably also mention some of the other infrastructure at Mars that is so important for Perseverance to accomplish its mission. So not stuff that's on the surface necessarily, but the stuff that's orbiting overhead. Can we kind of cover those two things real quick? Let's start with the ingenuity helping Perseverance, if it is. Yeah, that's one of the ideas that it could do. It has a little camera on it, um, and it will provide some pretty amazing pictures of the rover itself as it's flying around. And the idea being, this is kind of the demonstration, because it's a technology demonstration, it's not critical to the success of the mission, but it could theoretically fly forward, scout ahead, get a map of the future terrain that would help rover planners uh, direct the route of the Perseverance rover for the future without having to drive very slowly and you know stumble upon it itself. So that's one of the benefits it could provide to the mission. Um, and then again, it's really, again, technological demonstration. What can we do on the surface of Mars? And then, of course, just some amazing pictures that we'll send back. 
In terms of infrastructure, this is a really important point. And I think this is something, you know, we can go back to that slide at some point later, but you know, Mars exploration doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? Like you need to have a broad infrastructure of hardware in order to make sure you can maximize the science you do to get it back to earth. One of the yeah. most critical problems, a very practical problem, right? is just how fast, how big your bandwidth is of data communicating to something on the surface back to earth. These rovers you'll see has a tiny little kind of hexagon shaped antenna and that can talk directly to earth, but at the rate of like bits per second, right? Tens of bits per second, extremely slow. So it's like a modem in the 1980s for those of you who were alive during that point. But we're able to get so much data back. This uh, rover itself, the Perseverance, has something like 8 billion cameras on it, I think is the rough technical uh, estimate. <laughs> Tons of data is going to be generated and all that needs to get back. But we have a satellite communications system around Mars, right? That's the only other planet we know of beyond Earth that has a high speed satellite communication system. The two orbiters, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and MAVEN, uh, which are both NASA missions at Mars, and then there's a European orbiter, the Trace Gas Orbiter, all have specialized hardware to rapidly communicate at megabits per second, right? Millions of times faster than the direct to Earth communication. And they communicate with the rovers, they pass over, and then they send that data back to Earth. That's how we're able to communicate. Those are mission critical infrastructure orbiters in addition to the science that they do. And we have to remember that absent those orbiters, right? We don't have the amount of beautiful pictures, data, all this other stuff that's you know now enabled by them. That cannot happen on Mars. And then we think about something like sending humans to the surface of Mars. You need even more amounts of data, even more reliable infrastructure. All that stuff is required to succeed in missions like this, right? So the Perseverance rover, you know, is part of what we call as of NASA's Mars Exploration Program. And that was this is this unique kind of bureaucratic effort to fully characterize and understand Mars as a system, right? As a planetary system. All these missions fit together and, and augment and complement each other. And that includes by providing the necessary hardware, communications infrastructure to enable the type of ex exciting and kind of unprecedented exploration that we're seeing. So remove one of those pieces and the entire program, you know, suffers. And so the idea that, you know, perseverance just isn't one mission, it's the culmination of 25 years of focused exploration driven by this broad scientific, in a sense, this incredibly ambitious scientific goal to characterize another planet at a level approaching Earth. Again, still way, way less we know about Mars than Earth because we don't live there, right? But for any other planet in our solar system, we know Mars now at this exceptionally high and detailed level because of this focused and kind of systematic approach to uh, exploration. So kind of as a, as a quick follow up and, and you know, let, let's let's let's, you know, marinate in this a little bit, maybe explore various aspects. Um, when you think about that, that kind of suite of, of, of missions of hardware that the infrastructure we've been referring to that, that's been built up over the years through the Mars exploration program via NASA, as well as missions uh, from from Europe and maybe other other contributors. Um, are there any single point failures that you think are really worth kind of thinking or worrying about that are that are beyond you know something like oh all the wheels all the wheels just went bad on perseverance and we're stuck you know i mean things that are maybe off planet anything in particular well the the most i'd say fragile system is the that satellite communication system right so without your satellite relay you can still talk to these missions on the ground but the amount of data comes back is a trickle and you lose a ton of possibility um, of scientific discovery with that i'd say like a, a good comparison is for those of you who remember the galileo spacecraft launched in the late 1980s after years of delay, its main antenna got stuck and failed to open. And that meant that they had to use a backup antenna, kind of like these direct to earth ones that sent at this fractional bit rate. And they only got about 70% of their original science plan data back, you know, when they were at Jupiter. So again, these pipelines of communication, you know, you can have all the great instrumentation you want, but if you can't talk to it, if you can't get the data back, right? It's kind of meaningless. And so having this, infrastructure to support these ground missions is really important but notably mars reconnaissance orbiter that was launched in 2005 right that's a 15 year old spacecraft it was designed to last five years mars uh, maven which is another orbiting spacecraft launched in 2013 uh, 14 and also beyond its design lifetime trace gas orbiter that's still within its original prime mission but all of these 
orbiters are aging and right now there's you know no plans to replace them at all and so wow. this kind of infrastructure we've built up over 25 years i should also say there's odyssey launched in 2001 19 years old way beyond its design lifetime this infrastructure is not being replaced and without that infrastructure we can't sustain this really high level of mars exploration that we've been doing but so far the money hasn't shown up and we're unable to build and maintain that kind of critical communications infrastructure Gotcha. Okay, that's a, that's a little preview, guys. It's a little preview for what we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, you know, this is this is actually a, a, a kind of a selfish question because it's one I, I really don't know the answer to at all. Um, I was reading somewhere. I'm, I'm thinking about ways that perseverance is kind of like an evolution of curiosity that everyone knows and loves, right? Um, but it's better than curiosity in some ways. And I was reading somewhere that that perseverance can actually do some kind of like semi-autonomous or autonomous driving. Is that is that true? Do you know anything about that? They've certainly upgraded the navigation and uh, terrain analysis systems. That's through software development. Uh, it's not going to move all that much faster than the Curiosity <laughs> rover, kind of as a function of just computational power. It's making this kind of 3D map using its uh, navigation cameras of its surroundings. And, uh, you know, the rover drivers kind of set where it wants to go, and it can kind of make some independent decisions along the way. It also has an upgraded landing system, which has a higher precision of uh, to for a pinpoint landing as it comes onto the surface of Mars, that really helps you choose these really exciting scientific destinations that can be surrounded by maybe more dangerous terrain, but the scientists and the engineers have a higher confidence you can land exactly in the safe zone. And so this terrain relative navigation, it's able to kind of take pictures and detect where it is on the surface of Mars and actually kind of direct itself during the landing process in February in order to reach that higher level of landing precision. So there's certainly a lot of system upgrades that have been made through this uh, development process for perseverance. And of course, a lot of this, again, depends on the fact that we've had 25 years of investment of these like incredibly capable engineering, uh, computer software engineers and scientific uh, understanding of Mars through this program, right? Again, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. This is the culmination of decades of work. And without that, you can't just you know will that into being. It takes time to build that expertise up and maintain it. And so again, perseverance is again this kind of this culmination of this incredible period of Mars exploration that for a lot of us has been basically our entire waking awareness of our lives that we've seen NASA be sending missions and other nations like ESA sending missions to Mars almost every launch opportunity, which happens every 26 months. 26 months. So um, I want to get into the Mars sample return stuff and search for life real quick, but, but right, right before I do, I, I feel like we would be uh, negligent to not kind of mention, I mean, it seems old hat maybe to us, uh, to folks who, who cover this all the time and who kind of live and breathe this stuff, but um, it, I feel like we probably need to talk about uh, EDL, entry, descent, and landing, because this is the second mission to use the so-called sky crane concept um, that was pioneered with Curiosity that lets you get that small pinpoint landing. I guess it's going to be better now. Um, so are, is, it, is it still seven minutes of terror? Is it now just maybe seven minutes of like vague queasiness like is it still terror i mean don't, i have i haven't we've already done it once so does that mean it's going to work this time for sure right right help me out uh, Casey. I'm, 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 I'm getting nervous <laughs> i'd say it's still terror uh, when you when you're <laughs> trying to land a 2.7 billion dollar rover on another planet and you have one successful data point you know that line that you draw extrapolation can go pretty much anywhere you want to from one successful data point so it's certainly I'd say maybe less imposing, um, but again, you know, these are boutique handmade items, right? They, they do their best obviously to build these incredibly well. And there are a lot of these landing systems you're building to print, right? Exactly as they built them for curiosity, but it's not like there's an assembly line. It's really hard to validate that these will all work perfectly always, right? They even had actually quite a bit of problems retesting and revalidating these giant hypersonic parachutes that have to deploy to help slow the mission down. Even though they had used the same ones for Curiosity, retesting them, they realized they weren't quite as reliable as they had originally thought. So Mars is good at humbling our ambitions, right? Mars is a hard place to go to. It has just enough atmosphere where you have to deal with it, but not enough to really easily slow you down like you can on you know, thicker atmosphered planets like Titan even, or, or Earth. And so you have to have this hybrid landing system using retro rockets, using parachutes, and using these types of systems to de deploy quite a bit of mass onto the surface. And you have to do that all, of course, autonomously and flawlessly, right? There's a phrase in space exploration, one strike and you're out. 
right? You don't get a lot of leeway when you're trying to do something as delicate as landing this mission on another planet. It all has to work perfectly. Um, yeah, so we've had one demonstration. It's worked. That helps. Um, but again, it doesn't mean, you know, it's we don't know exactly that failure rate uh, because we've only done it once before. So they do their best to build these, test them, analyze them all in advance, but it's still a scary seven minutes particularly for the scientists and engineers who've invested 10 years of their lives uh, building the instrumentation, preparing for that moment, right? And so it's going to be a relatively white knuckle experience uh, for them and for me, frankly, when this lands in, on the 18th. For me too, for me too. Okay, excellent. Well, let's let's go ahead and advance the next slide, organizers, please. I should also mention we have Sonia Buddha and uh, Jeff Delecio on, on the back end here. Uh, Siam's excellent, excellent. Uh, folks working working for us here. So um, we are going to now dive in a little bit to sample return. And what you're seeing here on your screen is uh, the actual sample tubes that will contain the precious, precious material from Mars that will then go into this canister. Um, so sample return, you know, it really, it sounds so easy, especially when you think about stuff like uh, you know, if anyone who's a who's a, a student of of space history would know that during the Apollo missions to the moon, uh, I mean, astronauts brought back hundreds of pounds of moon rock. It, no big deal, right? I mean, you just it's, you just go get it and you bring it back, right? But uh, it's not actually quite that simple, of course. Uh, and I think if we advance a slide once, I, I'd love to kind of get you, Casey, to because I, I looked at this and I just I I had like flashbacks to my over. calculus class and just you know <laughs> organic chem like reaction charts. I was like, I, I don't know right. what, what's happening. So so what what are we looking at here? What is this? What are we seeing? Yeah, this is. This is a relatively simplified <laughs> diagram. This is a simplified of, of, version. Yeah, of uh, what it's going to take to return these samples from the surface of Mars. Okay. So, I mean, setting up some context here, right? Yeah, yeah. Sample return, why is it maybe even important to start with? You know, why can't we just do this stuff on the surface? There yeah. are scientific questions that require instrumentation that have levels of power or size that we just cannot miniaturize and put on a mission on the surface, right? You can't miniaturize a particle accelerator very well. Uh, you can't minimize the power constraints of something you need to heat to high temperatures in order to, you know, see what kind of gases and, and make up com composition of, of these types of samples are from. So there are fundamental physical constraints that limit the types of scientific investigations you can do on other planets robotically, right? And also, I'd say budgetary constraints too, right? We have to work within this net, you know, a, a limited budget profile. And so bringing them back to Earth, you, we have great scientific instruments here, right? We don't have to worry about building an instrument that has to work in a vacuum and autonomously by itself. So if we can bring these samples back, we can experiment them with great instrumentation, and we can save these samples. So within the next 50 years, if we think of a new way to analyze things, the samples are there waiting for us. We're seeing that happen right now with Apollo. They've reopened samples from 1972 and are studying them anew using techniques and hypotheses that didn't exist back then. So sample return is just a gift that keeps on giving. But there's a high cost to that, right? You have to get those samples and bring them back. There's it's harder to go into it, you know it's hard enough to go out into space to explore and then you have to come back safely that adds that in just an order of magnitude more complexity right. so sample return it's been something that nasa's wanted to do at mars or i have to say the scientific community has wanted to do at mars since the 1970s right so more than 40 years you can actually look through old nasa budget proposals like i do for fun <laughs> um and you can find in 1978, they say, we're starting to study to think about how we can do a Mars sample return mission as soon as 1988, right? And of course that hasn't happened. It's been 40 years since that point, but it shows you that this has been a perpetual goal, long-term goal of the scientific community. And it's actually a formalized goal of the scientific community to bring back samples from Mars. So it, the scientific motivation is very strong, right? The payoff could be huge. It's going to be important even if there isn't life that they find on these. There's all sorts of dating and other things you can do with the samples. Okay, so you wanna get samples. What do you do? Well, you can send one big mega mission, right? That lands, grabs samples, contains its own rocket, launches back into space and then comes back to Earth and then has its return capsule and comes back down. You could do that. You would need a rocket larger than we currently have flying and you would need tens of billions of dollars up front to build that giant machine with one point of failure, right? If any part of that system failed, um, that's it for the entire mission. So what if 
the thinking goes, we split out every part of those efforts, right? The landing and grabbing the samples, the preparing them and launching them back into space as a second mission, and thirdly, once in space, bringing them back to Earth. And that's what NASA is pursuing with the European Space Agency. So they've actually signed an official agreement between NASA and ESA to both contribute uh, missions and hardware for what's going to be a multi-billion dollar trilogy of missions, right? This is the first example in history of the robotic missions depending on the success of the prior mission, right? So we've talked about the Mars program before us. While all of them complement each other, they're not required for each other to succeed. For Mars sample return, every single mission of these three mission trilogy has to work or we don't get the samples back. So, so that's that one point of failure, we have like five? Right, it's <laughs> three, but the trade-off is you get to spread over that cost over time. And that's a very right. practical way that we have to approach exploration, but it also allows international partnerships like ESA, uh, the European Space Agency, to come in with NASA and really work very tightly together to do something this ambitious. So what we're seeing here in this plot, we see on the left uh, the launching of Perseverance, right, to go and collect the samples. Yeah. The second rocket in the middle uh, launches a sample retriever rover. So basically another rover that lands near Perseverance and picks up all the little sample tubes it's going to leave on the ground, okay. sticks them into what's called a Mars Ascent Vehicle, a MAV, and then that launches, that'll be the first autonomous launch of a rocket from another planet. That wow. goes in orbit around Mars. Third rocket on the right, that launches an orbiter that will dock with the orbiting samples at Mars, also autonomously, store those samples, and then leave Mars orbit and come back to Earth. That has a small little uh, Earth return canister, right, that we've seen in Stardust and Genesis and will be happening with the Cyrus-Rex, uh, the sample return missions that have already been demonstrated. And in ideally early 2030s, that sample return canister will go through Earth's atmosphere, land somewhere in Southern Utah desert, um, be collected and contain those precious samples. So it, it says three mission, three launches, big contributions from ESA, big contributions from NASA, and it's the most ambitious Mars mission we've attempted to date. So it's a very exciting, and you can see somewhat complex and delicate uh, uh, project ahead of us. And again, viewers, just, just to recall, this is the simplified version that you're seeing on on screen and so really what we're saying here is that perseverance is 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 in a very profound sense more than the sum of its parts and it's it's writing a check that we're gonna have to cash for decades if we're gonna i mean yeah. you know or maybe that's not the best analogy but the, you know if the investment that it's making is only gonna pay off if we manage to to pull off all these other things um of course it sounds like it's gonna be really cool in its own right but you know maybe maybe I, let, let's let's take a look at where it's gonna go you already mentioned jezero crater a little bit and i think actually let's let's look at the next slide and i can just show folks i'm pretty sure the jezero crater on my map of mars here i think that it's right go a little like to the other side yeah oh it's over, oh, it's over here i think so yeah, yeah I, if I, uh, I move it's... my finger closer it, it, <laughs> it's right there there it is yeah. <laughs> All right, there it is. That's Jezero Crater, and uh, as Casey was saying, this is a really cool uh, crater lake, kind of like Tahoe, right? Where you have a river that runs through it without Brad Pitt this time. Um, that's an old rat man. I'm showing my that age. we know, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. um, <laughs> I guess so. So, and what's so special again about about Jezero really is that this was when water was flowing across, flowing in rivers and pooling in in, in depressions on Mars's surface. And it had, I guess, lots of rich sediments and things that were stored or going, flowing into this crater and not coming back out. Um, can you tell us a little more about, you know, why this particular site was chosen? Why it's so exciting versus the entire rest of the planet? I mean, is this is this the one place that you would pick um, out of the whole planet to like hinge, you know, the next 30 years of science on, for instance, right? Well, well, who am I to uh, question the judgment of the Mars science community? Yes. It, it, yes. So actually they went through it. There was a five year process of the Mars science community that was open to any scientist and actually anyone in the public. They, they evaluated something like 30 different sites to land on because you're right. This is going to be the site where NASA and, and the European Space Agency spends the next 10 to 15 years putting all of their efforts into. Wow. So this is a big deal. Uh, it's exciting, as you point out, because it, it looks like it held a lake back in this period. I love this term called the Noachian 
uh, a period of Mars's history where it was warm and wet. It was about four-ish billion years ago. And it also had, as you said, these rivers running into it, creating a delta, the deltaic system, kind of like what you see with the Mississippi Delta. Um, and all of those things do is they collect these, you know, on Earth, they collect organic sediments. So if there were organics on Mars, there's a good chance they could be preserved in these layered sediments created by this delta, deltaic system. We don't know if that's true. That's why we're going to look. So the, the big delta is probably the big flashy, you know, feature. There's a lot of other important stuff in Jezero Crater. It's a very complex very rich area of scientific exploration. A lot has happened there over the years. It presents a lot of opportunity to kind of do dating, to kind of validate the uh, understanding of the history of Mars's surface and its chronology over time. Um, it's going to be, it's just a very rich scientific site. And as you can see, they've already proposed a traverse, a, a rover traverse to kind of go to some of these key areas. And again, look for these uh, biosignatures and understand again, this kind of geological history of the Mars surface. All that can happen, we should emphasize, without any sample return. So this is the in situ science that can happen with perseverance. Then the sample return is going to help us understand that really that dating history, um, a deeper understanding if there's biosignatures, right? It's just a signature. We saw that with Venus recently. They have a hint of biosignature in, the, in its atmosphere that opens up and begins a scientific process. It doesn't answer anything. And so that's bringing them back will help us answer those questions better. Um, so that's where, you know, so Jezero Crater, again, it went through this long five-year process where the scientific community debated very intensely. They selected down to three different sites a few years ago. Those went through further uh, analysis and argumentation. And ultimately, the NASA science administrator selected the site on the recommendation of the Mars science sample um, selection community. And that's kind of how that process works. That doesn't say there aren't other really amazing places to visit on Mars, right? Mars is a big planet, right? Its entire surface is about the equivalent of all of the um, surface of Earth, right? If you ignore the oceans. And so we've only landed a handful of times on Mars, right? So if you can think about it, if you just had to choose 10 or so places to land on Earth, could you fully characterize the Earth that way, right? Do you fully understand what's going on? Of course you don't, it's a huge place. Uh, so Jezero kind of won this process now, and it's going to be our focus for the next 10 to 15 years. Beautiful. Okay, and, and real quick, you know, you mentioned the Traverse. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, obviously, at this point, for folks who don't know, that uh, Perseverance, just like Curiosity and several other uh, Mars missions in the past, is nuclear-powered. Now, it doesn't carry a nuclear reactor on board. You know, it's not going to uh, have a meltdown or anything like that, but it does carry what's called, um, uh, I think it's a RTG uh, is, is the broad radioisotope thermoelectric generator. Yep, an RTG yeah. that carries plutonium 238, non fissionable form of plutonium. Basically, just gets off a lot of heat and it yeah. turns that heat into electricity. And so it can last a long time, longer than just five years, which is why I guess we're maybe seeing this extended traverse uh, in theory that goes out of Jezero to other places. So I guess the question would be, you know, Jezero is really cool. It's going to be the locus, the epicenter of, of all our Mars science for a, quite a while, it looks like, provided everything goes well. Uh, where might the mission go after that, though? People, have people talked about that, if it can get out of the crater? Yeah, there's there's extended mission proposals where it could go out of the crater to this place called Midway, which is a midway between Jezero and this place called Northeast Sirtis, which is another very interesting spot on the surface of Mars. Actually, they don't really know if they'll be able to do that, though, because of the second part of this trilogy of missions, right? The sample retrieval rover that's going to have to land near the samples and load them into this Mars Ascent vehicle. NASA is actually looking at keeping Perseverance around there as a backup to load those samples just in case something goes wrong with that little rover that just picks up and slots them in the the Mars Ascent vehicle. That may limit the options of that mission until after that second part has occurred. So there's all these trade-offs you have to start making. Once you flip into sample return, right? Once that becomes the most important goal, everything else kind of becomes subsidiary to that. And that's actually one of these big transitions that's happening in Mars exploration, where again, instead of focusing on the in situ in place science we do there, everything is going to be about getting those samples back. And that's going to be 10 years or so of that focus at the expense of in situ science for this promise, right? For this potential, this holy grail of Mars science of getting those carefully curated pieces of Mars back to Earth for, for serious scientific investigation. So that, gotcha. you know, it's a high opportunity cost, 
but the payoff again could be huge and this is why they're doing this so I, this may be kind of a I don't think it's a dumb question, but I think it's a question that may not have a really easy and, and appealing answer. But I, I feel like I'd be remiss to not I, I ask about you know these precious samples. I mean, we only have so many cash tubes. I, I don't quite know how many tubes it is, but you only you only have so many shots. Um, how the heck are they going to prioritize and select those samples? Like, I, I, what I, I mean, I know they must have a process, but I, I mean, I'm very interested in, in telling our, our viewers um, what would what would constitute like um, you know a guaranteed like oh we're definitely going to put that in a tube versus like oh well that's kind of interesting but maybe we'll wait and keep driving. Could you could you right because you don't know what us? you're going to find in the future. You have to balance out what you can have. You know the bird in the hand versus two in the bush kind of problem is going to be the yeah. constant problem there. Um, and there is a process they're putting together on the science team. They have a number of experts in sample analysis that are part of the science team. And it's going to be like, again, most great endeavors in science, it's going to be an open and vigorous debate on the team as it happens, right? Because there's only so much you can plan for in advance. You have to react to what you see at the time. And so there's going to be, it's going to be a mix of trade-offs, like what types of uh, science are going to be really important should they come back? understanding the context in which you're finding these samples on the surface and then of course the relative ease can you acquire these samples fast enough right the longer you're on the surface the more opportunity there are for something to go wrong right and so you have to kind of balance out this whole operational cadence of future risk and also the potential return and so the, it's a it's a one of those things where there's no clear answer but it's absolutely going to be you know this is a i think a two, three to four hundred person science team on the perseverance mission and there's going to be, you know, there's groups who are focused on the sample return aspect um, and, all, you know, the broader team itself is all going to be invested in this. So there's going to be, again, very vigorous debates as they're on the surface to make those decisions. Because I think, again, off the top of my head, it's something around 30 samples they could potentially bring back. And so, you know, any, you know, even one sample would be huge, right? Um, but they have to, again, make that decision. They have to commit to those and, and try to balance out that risk versus reward. This is NASA's entire robotic Mars history spending over time. Um, and again, it really averages out to about 500 million a year. That's about 2% of NASA's budget on average. And which is for one planet, it's the most NASA has spent going to any planet, any single destination. But in the context of NASA itself, right? Like it's, it's a fraction, it's a 2% of you know, NASA spending over the years. It's very modest considering Everything we know about Mars pretty much like has come from sending robots there uh, to look for us. You can see the history of kind of Mars policy in this budget chart. Um, the very early 60s, the early Mariner missions, that was that first colored in chart, Mariner 4, the very first, you know, quote unquote, digital uh, representation of the surface of Mars that they hand colored in as the bits came down. Uh, and then going into the 1970s with the later Mariners and then the big spike there is the Viking missions. And I think what's notable about this chart is that it shows you for Viking, right, the first two landers on Mars in, in the mid-70s, that was a, a Cadillac level mission. That was the most, and remains, adjusted for inflation, the most expensive planetary mission NASA has ever done. Wow. And that was because, I mean, they functionally built five spacecraft, two, uh, three landers and two orbiters, and they built a third lander just as a spare. <laughs> That's how much the kind of money it was throwing. It was the top priority, right? You can see the consequence of basically not finding life on yes. Mars. It, it yes. collapsed, right? And you've seen like, so the early part of Mars exploration is kind of marked by these big spikes in funding, but no long-term program or focus, right? 1980s, this dismal period of planetary exploration. That's actually why the Planetary Society, my organization was founded in early 1980 uh, in order to react to that collapse in, in planetary exploration funding at NASA. Um, and then this kind of slow growth and then until it hits the 2000s and you see that, you know, it's spiking around, but much more steady. That's the program that we know today, the Mars Exploration Program that has provided us with all of these incredible missions and this comprehensive systematic understanding of Mars as a planet, not just as, you know, kind of stochastic pieces of information from random flybys. And so even though the overall level is a lot lower than what we spent at once for Viking, the overall commitment has been more steady and that's really allowed us to gain this understanding you can see right now that little bump right on the right side that's perseverance uh, that's the cost of you know that's the addition you know that kind of includes the development cost of perseverance there you can see it's trending down it's kind of going to go bounce around as we do mars sample return at, at roughly that level for the next 10 years um, but again this is that really this kind of funding total if you wanted to add this all up 
adjusted for dollars now, it's about $28 billion over the history of NASA. But that's over again, 65, you know, almost 70 years of exploration. Um, yeah. This is not a bad cost. You know, at the same time, the government spends right now about four and a half trillion dollars a year, and we're spending about, on average, 500 million of that uh, exploring Mars robotically at NASA. Wish we could change some of those numbers. Penny for NASA. Um, so, you know, this graph <laughs> does show some interesting things. I mean, like you mentioned, the, the precipitous falling off a cliff where uh, Viking did not deliver life results. And, and then it just sucked the wind out of the sails, all the oxygen out of the room, whatever metaphor you want to have for defeat and, 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 and bad things happening. You know, do you think that, that uh, do you think that perseverance is, is potentially, I mean, it seems like it's also one of these knife edge things where, I mean, of course it could crash land on Mars and I, I should throw salt over my shoulder or something to say I don't want that to happen. <laughs> um, but, but it does seem like we're at another one of these inflection, inflection points. Is that kind of the, the, the pop phrase where um, we could see perhaps a, uh, profound shifts once again in this budget line in this little squiggly line based upon what's going to happen next year do you think that's true yeah i mean i think if perseverance fails catastrophically you cannot follow up with mars sample return as planned you'd have to rebuild a version of it and fly it again and you know perseverance was first announced in 2012 and it's launched in 2020 right it took eight years to build it um it's not these aren't things you can just pull off the shelf when you need it Add into that the political consequences of such a failure, very unlikely they would just try to rebuild it right away. So the future of Mars does hinge on the success of Perseverance right now. The consequences beyond this is that, again, we'll be focusing on sample return. There aren't any new missions beyond sample return in the docket. That's the first time that that's really been the case since the mid-1990s. There's a lot of other places in the solar system that are vying for a very limited pot of money and deserve exploration too, frankly, right? And so during that period in the 80s where you see this cratering of Mars funding, that was where we were building the Galileo spacecraft to go to Jupiter. That's where we were funding Voyager uh, in the outer planets. Cassini also happened in the 1990s. Right now we're trying to explore Europa to build the Europa Clipper spacecraft. But then, of course, there's all these other destinations. Should we go to Venus now to investigate that phosphine claim? Should we go to other, you know, back to Enceladus? Should we do sample return from Enceladus? We should do all these things, right? And so there is a political aspect, and this is why I think space policy becomes so important into understanding the machinations of what drives this squiggly line here. You know, funding is, you know, how much money an organ, a, a program gets is an expression of political priority fundamentally. Yeah. And so you can see, you know, over time, the longer something you build up this kind of funding for something, it can be very hard to sustain over time. Or if you spend so much like Viking, it can be very easy for other places to say, hey, it's our turn now. And you get these kind of in very stochastic kind of commitments to these various scientific endeavors. So understanding the motivations and machinations of space politics and policy helps you understand why we go to some places and not to others. And I think right now with Mars, we are at this, again, this transition point. So a lot hinges on perseverance succeeding. And even again, the focus on Mars sample return is probably gonna come at a cost to doing other types of missions at Mars beyond sample return. And I think that's a cost I think most scientists are willing to pay, but we have to be aware of, you know, kind of to then allow us to focus on other parts of the solar system. So I just wanna note, um some of the uncertainties you've talked about and maybe heighten them just a smidge. I, so you're, you're, let me get this straight. Essentially you're saying that, that, that this, this, uh, what's, what's going to happen next year, you know, circa February and, and moving forward when perseverance hopefully lands successfully on the planet is going to be a transition point, a profoundly important, uh, point, uh, where all kinds of things can happen and change, uh, for the Mars program, but because so much of the planetary science eggs at NASA are in that basket, in the Mars basket, it's really going to have this, ripple effect that'll that'll affect the entirety of the program and thus our exploration and understanding of the solar system and of course that's also right after we're gonna you know presumably have some kind of result from the u.s presidential election and it is i believe you know to some degree the presidents the presidential administrations who you know kind of give some of the marching orders in, in tandem with congress and and uh the the scientific community uh but it's i mean i you, we didn't even mention that and i know that's a whole other can of worms uh but you know it, Maybe we can mention this a little more later, but I, I, I should go ahead and bring it up now. Uh, you know, reading the tea leaves, 
do you have a sense of, of uh, planetary science exploration priorities between uh, the Trump administration and the, the notional Biden administration? Is one going to be better for uh, exploration of Mars or of the solar system in general than the other? I mean, maybe we can't say anything now. Yeah, I, well, one thing that's fortunate that we have, there's a formalized process for setting priorities uh, for space science, not the human space exploration side, but for space science. Uh, NASA has four main areas that they do space science exploration, right? Planetary science, uh, astrophysics, heliophysics, and then Earth science. So each of those four distinct areas, they have a process through the National Academy of Sciences every 10 years to set basically what's our next 10-year priorities, right? They call this the decadal survey, right, for every decade. That process is happening now, and that really helps with continuity between administrations because it's this consensus report from the entire scientific community that says, here's our top goals for the next 10 years. So right now, that goal says Mars sample return. So in a sense, that doesn't change. For, and again, that's really helped. You know, We saw that Obama to Trump. We actually saw quite a bit of consistency in terms of the science program. And it's very likely that consistency will continue into the Biden administration. We've talked a lot about NASA's role, NASA, NASA, NASA. Right, to, to throw back to the, the Brady Bunch. Gosh, I'm, I'm really showing my age. This is terrible. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> shouldn't do that. Anyway, so all this NASA stuff, but there's obviously other spacefaring nations that have their own planetary exploration programs who are in some cases are our partners. So um, if, if NASA may be stepping away, or maybe not stepping away, but rather changing its stance and its perspective and its approach to Mars, um, is there anyone kind of filling in the gap? Like what, what is the rest of exploration of Mars look like uh, absent or with the shifted um, more Mars sample return focused uh, lean approach that uh, that uh, NASA seems to be pursuing. Yeah, that's and this is a really good point that we should dwell on for a minute because you're right, it's not just NASA. Th this year, 2019, sorry, what year are we in? 2020. <laughs> 2020 uh, is seeing an unprecedented amount of attention for Mars internationally. Uh, we've seen the launches of Tianwen-1, which is China's first uh, independent Mars mission, which is an orbiter and a rover. Very exciting mission. Huge step for them if that succeeds next year. So that's a very exciting mission. Uh, the United Arab Emirates launched their very first space mission, HOPE, which is going to orbit Mars um, and uh, study Mars' climate and climate history. Those are all arriving next year along with NASA's Perseverance rover. Uh, we also have ESA has its ExoMars rover, uh, supposed to launch this year, now delayed to 2022. That's going to have a drill that's going to go down two meters into the subsurface to look for bio, uh, biosignatures. So lots of really exciting missions. And of course, at Mars now, we have the India's Mars Orbiter mission, MOM. Uh, we mm -hmm. have ESA's Trace Gas Orbiter. We have uh, ESA's Mars Express. Um, and there's so there's, I think, internationally, we're seeing more nations increase their capability to get to Mars and explore it again in this in situ, in place way that will help offset a lot of the focus that NASA is going to be putting into on sample return, you know, that has that big payoff at 10, 15 years down the line. So I think that's actually one of this big, and, you know, NASA, oh, and I should also mention uh, Japan, JAXA's uh, the space agency, uh, Japan Space Agency is going to launch a sample return mission to Phobos, uh, one of Mars's moons. And all of these missions from without China, but NASA has contributions to a number of these missions. So even if they're not doing the entire spacecraft, they may pay for a, a group of scientists to include an instrument um, or participate in the mission itself to get some science for the community out of this as well. So that's actually one of these really exciting things is that it's not just NASA anymore, right? We have this growing capability across the world of these other nations pursuing this peaceful scientific explorations of Mars that will add to our overall knowledge of this planet. And, you know, I think a, a little bird told me, or really rather tweeted at me, that um, apparently the Planetary Society is also involved in that, uh, that JAXA, uh, Japanese Phobos mission. Is that true? Are you involved with that? <laughs> we have, uh, so the planetary side, so I do like the policy and, and politics for the society. I help get our members engaged in politics and to be good, you know, citizens and advocate for NASA. Another part of the planetary society is directly supporting technology and exciting projects that governments generally, you know, in this gray area between when governments invest a little bit and a lot, we try to fill in that middle part. 
So we helped fill in that middle part for this thing called uh, Planet Vac. It's like a simple planet uh, sample return acquisition system. It's like a vacuum that just sucks up some regolith. Uh, we actually, it's going to be sent to the moon and there's a contribute, the, the same people are going to be contributing to part of uh, the MMX mission, this JAXA's mission to Phobos using that same technology. So thanks to Planetary Society members who kind of, it's basically a Kickstarter for advanced space technology, we helped mature this system, we helped demonstrate its viability, and now we're seeing it happen in space. So that's actually, yeah, it's, it's a very cool, exciting aspect of that mission to see that come to fruition. Super cool. I'm glad you mentioned that that's kind of what a key thing that Plants Earth Society does, like with the uh, the light sail, solar sail missions that, that you all have launched as well. Very cool yep. stuff. Uh, could revolutionize space uh, space travel as we know it. Um, so I think we I think what we're going to do now is kind of do a little bit of a hybrid thing. We still technically need to discuss on the agenda. We need to discuss some things about people. Big meat bags going on Mars. These these you know these huge bacteria filled meat bags we call. Uh, humans that, and astronauts that could uh, contaminate this planet. And I want to emphasize how important this really is, because here we are in 2020, where uh, a virus is ravaging the globe, changing everything. And, and, and keep in mind, you know, this is this. No one knows exactly what happened, but, you know, it looks like it probably came from a so-called spillover event. Right. Presumably somewhere in China. And from there, it has swept across the entire world and changed the world profoundly. And I think that's a very powerful object lesson when you think about how you know it wouldn't be the exact same thing on mars right or on earth but th there are a lot of a lot of similar issues tied up here in terms of like how do you how do you protect against that kind of thing happening what does it mean if humans go to mars what does it mean if we bring stuff back i'm, I'm, I'm asking all these questions because actually these are the kinds of questions that have been streaming through the chat that people have been asking so i think it's time for us to talk a little bit about about human exploration and what that might mean to mars and how the heck we're going to do it safely yeah, so there's this, you're, the term for this area is called planetary protection, right? In, in terms of forward and backwards contamination of another planet or of that planet to Earth. How can you take care of that when clearly it's pretty hard here on Earth not to have a virus or other kind of microbes spread through the population incredibly fast? Something that always struck me is uh, John Grunsfeld, who was an astronaut, he helped repair the space shuttle. He was the NASA science administrator for a while. I heard him talk once and he said that, you know, spacesuits leak. There's no perfect spacesuit, right? Which is sounds alarming, but they just they, they just build in that tolerance. It's like very tiny. There's just no perfect seals. But what that means is any astronaut, even an astronaut, even in a spacesuit on Mars, is going to be leaking millions of little viruses and bacteria just out of their suit because we ourselves are comprised of these bacterial colonies and viruses and so forth. So there's no perfect way to prevent contamination with humans going to Mars. The way that they do that here on Earth, right? They either bake a spacecraft at like hundreds of degrees for days at a time. That's what they did with Viking to decontaminate it or, or wipe it down, you know, very carefully with like um, alcohol swabs and other things. Notably, you can't bake a human at 500 degrees, right? Well, and can't. then have them be a productive. You can't, you would, they would not be a productive astronaut um, after that experience. And so, that there's a fundamental contradiction or difficulty about how do you adhere to planetary protection principles, which again derive from actually the Outer Space Treaty, without you know limiting human exploration. And there's really no good way to do that. NASA is actually in a process right now with the National Academies of Sciences trying to say can can we pursue exploration in a responsible way? Can we choose places on Mars that are not likely to be uh, uh, habitable for our own bacteria. But ironically, a lot of those places we want to go to because they might have the water that astronauts need to live off of, right? They might have the environments that we would want to be in to use for our own resource production. So we haven't solved these problems yet. This is an open problem. And it may just be we either have to take the risk of contaminating Mars um, and do it in a, as responsibly as we can, or the extreme alternative would be to call Mars kind of a a protected environment, right? An ultra protected environment and not even allow people to be there if we're really concerned about the consequences of our own contamination. A lot yet to figure out. So that's one of the fundamental problems of this. Um, coming back, that's also the big problem. Part of the process of even Mars sample return is that we have to build an incredibly secure content, you know, contamination environment to analyze these uh, return samples on Earth. 
So they have these CDC, you know, uh, uh, level facilities that are meant to keep things from getting out, right? That NASA would use as a blueprint to build a thing to, to analyze these Mars samples, just in case, right? We don't know if there's anything, but you have to be careful. But at the same time, you don't want to contaminate those samples with our own bacteria and inadvertently, you know, discover life when you're just found, you know, Streptococcus or something that's on someone uh, on humans. Yeah. yeah. And so you actually need this even higher level of contamination prevention going into these samples too. And so again, as we are seeing very vividly, um, it's very hard to control this kind of stuff. And this is the stuff that we have to then approach carefully, responsibly, um, but have no clear, easy answers to this. So, and, and so the sample return stuff, again, you're saying that's gonna be landing, I guess, in the desolate wastes of, of, of uh, the deserts of Utah. Um, I mean, how fast is that going to slam into the ground? I presume there's going to be parachutes, right? I'm, I'm picturing just this, you know, the blob yeah. coming out, the Andromeda strain. Uh, but I guess <laughs> there's actually no parachutes on it. They're, they've designed these so hardy, they just slam right into the ground, and uh, they're designed to to take it. Because um, then it's one less thing to fail, right? If you depend on parachutes that are then you know frozen in space for I don't know six to seven years, uh, remove that from the equation, right, and just let it slam into the ground. So yeah, they've, just, and they've done this the before. Parachute. Do the yeah, it's, it's the I, I shoot the hostage equivalent of uh, uh, problem solving for engineers. I, I mean, wow. So the most precious samples in the history of planetary science are going to slam into uh, the desert at terminal velocity, and, and they have to be super safe because if they crack open, we could all die. Okay. All right, Graham. I'm, I'm glad we set that. Okay. Um, so um, now this is a question from Anna. We're, we're transferring into, into Q&A now, folks. So please, please hit us with your questions. Um, oh, oh, we got a poll. We got another poll. Oh, can we do the poll? Can we do the poll real quick? It'll be fast. Um, really quick. When do you predict humans will land on Mars? And we'll do Anna's question and, uh, and then we'll get more more questions. So is it 2030, 2040, 2050 or after 2050 or or never? Let's try to be quick here. Let's be snappy. I know everyone has their uh, their back pocket guess. So let's get these in, folks. And maybe while we're waiting, I will go ahead and set up, queue up Anna's very perspicacious question. Here we go. You discussed international interest in Mars exploration, but what about private company interests in Mars exploration? How could they impact and potentially expand knowledge of Mars? Do you see, Casey, a potential for privatization of certain aspects of Mars exploration? And how might this impact future NASA and international interest in Mars exploration? Wow. Okay. This is a, yeah, I mean, we should, we should spend a little time on this because this is a huge new development within Mars exploration. Oh, relatively well, optimistic. Yeah, There's a joke, right? Mars is always 20 years, humans on Mars are always yeah. 20 years away. And so it is here, so it is here. <laughs> uh, I, I, Casey, real quick, I wanna get your expert opinion. What do you think? If you had to pick one of these options, what would you pick? I would probably choose after 2050, <laughs> but with, but with an acknowledgement that there's kind of an X factor we're about to talk about where I, and my prediction models break down. So okay. if we're using NASA and other governments, definitely after 2050. Um, but the SpaceX thing we should talk about, um, I don't yeah. know how to predict that. I don't think anyone does. And that's an exciting situation to be in. So, so yeah, I mean, I don't even know where to begin because the, the roadster, the Elon Musk's uh, cherry red <laughs> Tesla roadster, just had its close and first close encounter with Mars, and is now uh, back coming towards the sun again, towards us a little bit. Uh, you know, they're talking about having this so-called Starship mega rocket that can be an interplanetary transportation system, uh, and, and it's obviously you know very very um, aggressive timelines, ambitious aspirational timelines in this. And I think typically the history with Elon Musk and, and, and SpaceX is that you can kind of do like a you know uh, maybe like a 50% fudge factor, 20% fudge factor for their for their 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 schedules, and they kind of tend to work. But even then, you're getting crazy crazy early times when there might be people on Mars. Um, yeah, so so I don't even know where to begin with this whole can of worms. What, what, is, what is possible? What how how could this influx of private interest uh, work with and maybe work against what's going on with traditional space agencies. So yeah, where do we begin? So I think, let's talk, let's step back and let's look at some of the differences first between an organization like NASA, which we can just use as a stand-in, I'd say for any national space program, and SpaceX where it is now. So, why haven't we gone? Why hasn't NASA sent people to Mars so far? 
Well, it's there, there's just a number of technological problems, right, that are expensive to solve. And when you're a federal agency in a democratic society, you have to address national priorities or you're not going to get a ton of money, right? So Apollo happened because it was basically a front in the Cold War. And it was a way to non-violently assert technological dominance over the Soviet Union. Once, it's, once it achieved that, money went away. Mars has never solved the problem at that level of a national priority for the United States or any other nation. And as a consequence, you haven't seen a similar marshalling of resources to this big, grand, government-sponsored endeavor. When you're a government agency, you reflect and are an arm of, let's again, the nation that you are, right? So the US, NASA is a proxy for the national capability of the United States. That means that NASA is highly incentivized not to fail at its job because it's not just a technical failure, it's not just an engineering failure, it's not just even a loss of human life, it's a statement, it's a symbolic failure of a nation. And so as a consequence, it has to be, it, it errs on the side of success at the at the cost of money, basically, right? It costs a lot of money or lack of ambition. Mm -hmm. A private company like space, and then one other thing is that politics changes over time. You can elections, the house changes over here every two years, Senate every six, you know, every could change every two years, elections every six. And of course the presidency changes every, could change every four years. And so NASA is a political system in a democracy that has to get its funding by being relevant to the political process at the time. Right, as opposed to following some grand, long-term, decade-long goal that the polit politicians now will see no benefit from. So those are the fundamental pro problems and difficulties for a government program to take on an extraordinarily ambitious, risky, and long-term effort like going to Mars. Okay, SpaceX, what's different about SpaceX to use this as a stand-in for any kind of well-funded, technologically capable company? SpaceX is a privately held company. Right. So Elon Musk is kind of its benign dictator and it can do whatever it, it can stick to these very long development goals because they're not responsive beyond a certain level. Kind of there's immediate business needs, but their long term goals are those of the person. And so there's a consistency or constancy of purpose that exists. And with that singular goal allows them to every intermediate step that they take can be a step towards that long term goal because they've had that for years. At the same time, they're a private company. They don't have that weighty symbolism loading them down. They can take more risks. They don't have to spread their money around in the same level politically in order to gain kind of funding that they would otherwise need like NASA does. So they have several advantages structurally that allow them to pursue a more laser focused, dedicated effort to get to Mars. Okay, so those, I'd say those are the two important ways to think about this. And this is why SpaceX is a new entity in how we think about space. We, you know, SpaceX as a company has an independent launch axis capability to, to orbit and beyond, which no other, you know, previously has been the domain of nations before, right? So we don't have a lot of historical analogs to help judge this. So they're building this Starship, they're building it. I think there's a good chance they can pull that off. They have the best rocket engineers in the business. They have a, a singular goal driving them to highly motivated. But the rockets are just one part of this, right? There's right. a number of serious technological issues that need to be solved beyond the rocket that's gonna get you there. Spacesuits on Mars, there's in situ resource utilization, there's the radiation environment, there's the psychological health. What's it like to be in a tin can in space and then on another planet forever, right? Where you just can't go outside. What's the governance structure going to look like if one person could punch a hole in the wall and kill the entire colony? What happens if there's food shortages? What, how do you resupply? How do you communicate? Do they have to launch their own communication satellites in order to stay connected to Earth? How do you resupply with advanced tool sets? You can't 3D print CPUs, right? You can't 3D print computer screens and other things. You have to bring those things from Earth with you and predict how you're going to use them and carry enough replacement parts so you're not, something. if something breaks, it's not an, a life-ending situation. So the rockets are one part of the equation, they're an important part, but literally everything else about living on Mars has to be figured out. And that's why I've become, in a sense, a little more uh, down on the immediate prospects of getting humans there, because again, these technological challenges are serious and immense. 
And a great book for anyone who wants to kind of read an example of this is Scott Kelly's book, Endurance, about the year he spent on the International Space Station. He spent more than half of his time fixing broken stuff on the station because stuff just breaks, right? This is entropy. And he's busy repairing his CO2 scrubber half the time with parts sent up through regular uh, supply runs from the ground. You don't have that kind of benefit or, or access to pieces that you do you know, in route to Mars or even on Mars itself. And so there's just even the fundamental challenges of being in Earth orbit should humble us a bit about the likelihood of getting to Mars on a long-term basis. Change it a little bit when you're talking about just being there for a little bit of time. So that's a long kind of soliloquy about Mars, but I would say yeah. SpaceX is building an incredible and exciting capability that has a, a number of advantages to how governments are able to pursue it. But at the same time, they just do not have the financial resources that governments do. And so this becomes just a question of how can each one ideally complement the other uh, and work together and, and advance that goal. Gotcha. I have a lot of questions I want to ask you because I, I always love our conversations, Casey. We need to do more often, but we'll do that some other time because there's great questions here from all kinds of viewers. Let's 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 kind of get through these little rapid fire if we can. Um, Heidi, I am a ten I am ten years old and a member of the Planetary Society. Shout out! Uh, how can we prevent Moxie from killing the archaea bacteria that thrive in low O2? I guess presuming that there are bacteria on Mars. How can we ensure that Moxie is just going to, you know, cause a bacterial genocide there in Jezero Crater? <laughs> I, Heidi, thank you first for being a member. I, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a, that's a good question. I, I'd say, as Lee said, there's probably not bacteria floating around in the air uh, in Mars. It's, it's a very highly radiation charged environment. There's a lot of UV radiation and cosmic radiation coming from space. There's not a much atmosphere around Mars that protects the surface the way that we have here on Earth. So most scientists don't think that there's active bacteria on the surface now. If there's life there still, it's probably down underneath the ground where it's more protected from radiation and maybe in these underground water or brine deposits, but less likely to be in the air. So my guess is that the people who designed MOXIE assumed that there wouldn't be archaeobacteria to worry about and they would just busy themselves along. But fundamentally, we just don't know if there would be because they haven't thought of, you know, they haven't incorporated that into their design. Sorry, airborne Mars microbes. We're, get, we're gonna kill you. Okay, um, here's one from Margaret. Uh, do you think that the Artemis program to the moon, this is NASA's uh, intention to send a man and a woman to the moon by 2024, specifically the uh, lunar South Pole region, which is filled with ice. Uh, do you think the Artemis program for the moon will substitute for the human to Mars advocacy efforts, whether by government or commercial space efforts, especially with the prospect of tourism? So I guess this is kind of the classic Earth versus Mars argument. Are they gonna are they gonna be fighting each other? Can they get along? Yeah, so I'd say yes, actually, at this point, I, I think for many of the reasons that I just went through in terms of how hard Mars was starting to look, at the end of the Obama administration, NASA was on a journey to Mars, was, was its catchphrase. And it was, frankly, pretty much a catchphrase. There wasn't a lot of hardware or program money being spent on a real Mars mission. When Trump came in, they actually kind of took the same pieces that they were all using for this uh, supposed journey to Mars and said, you're going to the moon now. Which I actually, they were all kind of doing anyway, but it was mainly, is more the rhetoric was Mars. So... Yeah. The current thinking now, or the current argument now, is that this is a moon to Mars program. And I think a lot of people seeing the money that's been flowing into, the attention that's been flowing into building the hardware for lunar exploration, when you really just get back to it, and this is this is what we think here at the Planetary Society, I just want to see humans get beyond low Earth orbit again. It's been more than, it's been 50 years almost, right? Let's so just get out. Ask. And then, so yes, yeah, it's... And then let's argue about where to go. And just in terms of practicality, in terms of access, in terms of safety, the moon is kind of it to go you know, at the level that we appear to be willing to invest in it. And so the trick then is, can you go to the moon in a smart way where you're not just going to the moon, but you're investing, you're, you're paying down these future expenses for going to Mars? Uh, that, I think, is still an open question, and I think that's actually where most of the advocacy should be right now, is focusing on, if we're going to the moon, we are going to the moon, let's make sure we do this in a, an expansive way where we don't just end up at the moon, but we put this down payment in to getting humans to Mars in the long term. 
and that takes work to do because it's very when you're facing the hard problems of getting humans to the moon right let's not minimize how hard that is it's very easy to say well let's just shunt all this mars stuff off to the future and just figure it out later and solve this one particular problem you have to do general solutions to human space or to human space flight that then will also allow you to get to mars in the future that's hard to do at the time but very critical it pays off I have to mention, because, uh, you know, what we're talking about really quickly, you know, when we talk about how uh, things didn't necessarily change that much, it was mostly a rhetoric change that occurred uh, and a kind of a reshuffling of existing pieces on the chessboard in between the Obama administration and the Trump administration with regard to human spaceflight destinations capabilities. Um, this harkens back to the so-called, uh, God, was it the, oh my gosh, I can't remember his name. Oh no, the Bridenstine, no, no not Bridenstine, no. Uh, it was a report that was written that was all about the so-called flexible path, where the Augustine key thing is report. you develop... Augustine report. And so you, the whole point, this is something NASA studied, was, you know, how are we going to get humans beyond low Earth orbit? And the key was, okay, well, let, let's let's focus on building these capabilities like big rockets and so on and so forth and, and uh, hefty uh, uh, propulsion methods uh, for once you're out there and uh, beyond Earth orbit. And then you can kind of go everywhere. The classic Arthur C. Clarke idea that, you know, you're halfway to anywhere once you're out of Earth orbit um, or yeah. in Earth orbit. Uh, so we're talking about the moon. We're talking about Mars. Uh, there's also the idea of going to small bodies like near-Earth asteroids. Um, I have to mention, though, because Casey, you were involved in this project a couple of years back. There was something that the Planetary Society suggested, kind of a middle path that could answer mm -hmm. or resolve some of these questions about how we're going to protect Mars, uh, how we could get to Mars sooner rather than later. Uh, it kind of seemed to check all the boxes for me. So I'm, I'm surprised we haven't talked about it until now. I mean, I guess maybe it's just, is it, what's the status of that? Tell us about this project that I have just teased. This idea. Uh, yeah, we call it humans orbiting Mars as a s approach, and we really helped in kind of looked at this JPL concept and uh, tried to think about if we want to get to Mars, let's you know what are the straightforward steps. They kind of said like if you want to get someone to home plate in a baseball game, you can hit a home run, or you can just hit a bunch of singles and advance one player to home base, right? So what steps can we take to advance humans to Mars? without having to go all in on this mega mission to land at once. And so this idea of humans orbiting Mars is, what if we develop the capability not to land right away, but to get humans to be able to orbit Mars to go most of the way, you test your, you know, you develop your long-term habitation systems, you develop your radiation resistance systems, you work through your psychological issues. Again, it's like doing Apollo 8 before landing with Apollo 11, right? You test every step of the way. Um, in that plan was start practicing at the moon and start landing on the moon a few times to practice your landing systems. Go and orbit around the moon for a long time to develop your long-term uh, habitation and life support systems. So in a way, it's very similar in, in its broad strokes to what we're doing now. But I'd say what has happened with Artemis is that, again, naturally, right, the, the difficulty and intensity of trying to get to the moon fast has basically sucked all the oxygen up out of the room, metaphorically speaking, for going to Mars. And so while we really say, you know, while people say there's a moon to Mars program, there's very little detailed work being done at this point to focus on that to Mars part, right? Everything's on the moon part right now. Um, and it's not, I'd say, necessarily bad faith or anything. It's just that if you're trying to land on the moon in four years, you're not going to have the headspace or, you know, you know, bandwidth to really focus on anything else. And we're seeing that. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So, so maybe we'll still end up being on Phobos before we get to the surface and we'll tell, tell, operate some robots or something. Um, there's a really I good question from, from, from <laughs> Joseph that. here. Um, what do you believe is the most critical bottleneck in our current technology for sending humans to Mars? In other words, uh, what capability do you believe represents the critical path to going to Mars? You know, so that could be big rockets, it could be robotics, it could be HAB stuff. What do you, what do you think, Casey? I think, yeah, I think it's automation. So right now for human spaceflight systems, let's use the International Space Station as an example of this. It's been up there for 20 years, incredibly successful, huge and the largest spacecraft ever made but it's in constant communication with the ground. It's managed from the ground, right? Houston, you know, is the command center for the space station. And, and of course in Russia as well, they have their command station there as well. But all the data, all the analysis, you know, and the resupply happens because they have teams of people on the ground that constantly monitor the status of that spacecraft. When you go to Mars, you move out of, you, you get so far away from Earth that you cannot have that real time 
communication or analysis and of what we kind of talked about earlier, you don't have the literally the uh, communications bandwidth. Uh, we have an entire system called TDRIS, uh, NASA's Data Relay Satellite Network, that orbits high above the Earth specifically to allow the space station to communicate at any point at high speeds to the ground. We will not have that going to Mars. And so we don't have any experience building human-rated spacecraft that are functionally independent from ground control. And that was same at the moon. We're, you know, only three seconds you know, light, you know, time to go back and forth and send a signal to the moon. That's functionally instantaneous, right? We do not have that at Mars. And there's been very little work to develop that. And that's, I think, one of those weird functional kind of just difficulties of sending humans to Mars that we haven't seriously grappled with. Of how do you have a spacecraft that constantly knows you need some advanced AI. It's like, am I healthy as a spacecraft? Do I detect things that are about to fail? Um, if those are about to fail, do I have pathways to figure out how to fix them or reroute them or, or help you know the astronauts solve those without having a team of people on the ground, right? Think of Apollo 13 with instant access to that information to give them a pathway to solve a potential engineering problem. So that's one of these, again, these fundamental problems with uh, getting to Mars is that autonomy that's going to be necessary for these spacecraft. So you hear that, Joseph? Get get started on developing the advanced AIs for us, please, if you could yeah. get on that. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, let's see. Got a couple more. Uh, we only have about five minutes left, so I, I, we only have time for one or two more questions um, before I have some closing remarks. Uh, this is from Megan. Uh, can Elon Musk colonize Mars without violating the Outer Space Treaty, which you've mentioned a couple of times? Yeah, that's actually one of those interesting kind of gray areas. So no nation can make a claim on another celestial body and it becomes more ambiguous with a person. Now, the, the, the thing is that international treaties apply to the citizens of the nation that signs them themselves. So Elon Musk as a US citizen is bound by the international or the outer space treaty um, because any claim to, uh, to land ownership is kind of ultimately a claim, you know, that's backed up by a nation, right? Because if someone challenges that claim, you know, this isn't the 1840s anymore with a homesteader out in Wyoming. This is uh, a national claim, you know, it, it kind of to resolve it, it would have to go to the to the nation itself. At the same time, they can just say that they're not doing that. And it's very unlikely that there'd be anyone else vying for their space mars is still a big place right um so it's again there's, there's a lot of space law that is completely theoretical because we haven't had the chance to test it out it hasn't become an issue yet so i think generally yes he would be okay creating a settlement there um but the idea would be that they couldn't necessarily claim it as their own um should anyone also want to show up there. But that's, again, hard to figure out. How do you really enforce that? It's not really clear. Right, it's, it's a whole can of worms. I still wonder if, you know, planetary scientists should be excited or, or terrified and angry about, about what SpaceX is, is trying to do, because it's, it's kind of you know, a double-edged sword. Here's one from Voss. I actually, Voss, wrote, I a, I actually wrote a paper about that with a philosopher and ethicist um, a couple of months ago, looking at that there's a scientists should actually consider take into account what's happening in the private sector as a way to prioritize their current science um, uh, goals to say we want to make sure we understand these environments in a pristine place before we start seeing private investment private commercial uh, resource utilization or anything there that could disrupt the scientific output or return of those places. Again, if you kind of, you know, we take an ethical point of like there is an inherent value uh, to scientific knowledge itself, and that kind of derives this thing. It's, it's, it's a fun paper, um, but it's, it, there's certainly serious things that we should consider, particularly in the scientific community, about how to prioritize places before they become subject to settlement and uh, resource exploitation. And, you know, maybe, if, I, I mean, if, if going out into the ether, if anyone from SpaceX happens to be watching this webcast, I hope you would consider with some of your incremental technology demonstrations and missions, you know, maybe trying to do some of the poor Mars scientists a few favors in characterizing, you know, including a few instruments on, on, your, uh, on your next Tesla that's going to crash land into the red planet. If you're watching, check out Casey's monthly policy podcast. 
Planter Radio Space Policy Edition. It's available wherever you're going to be finding your podcast from. It's really great. If you want to find uh, the best inside knowledge that you can hear about this on a podcast, this is the place to get it. I think it's the best podcast out there out of maybe the two that exist that are about space policy. I'll say that. No. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite the competitive environment, I have to say. So I think that brings us up to kind of the end here, Casey. Uh, any any final words? Any any pleas for uh, for Elon or other folks? <laughs> Well, I we talked about this a little bit, but smart sample return is a is a big big deal. It is the culmination of nearly 50 years of scientific exploration of Mars, and it's not guaranteed, right? We are just getting this started. So, assuming Perseverance lands successfully and collects its samples successfully, we need to see through as a community and as a advocates for space these follow-up missions to happen. These follow-up missions are going to be paid for and built and launched in the next five to six years. So this is the time, if you have, if you wanna see this happen, we need to make sure that we keep on our representatives in government um, and people that you know, just keep them excited about the potential return. So even though this is a change in Mars exploration, this is a huge opportunity that may have fundamental, profound consequences to our knowledge about the cosmos and our place within it.